Hello everybody, we're big, we're bad, we're back, and I'm, I think I'm in black or dark blue or something. Anyway, we're back Friday. So here we are in Sunset Sound Studio 3, as I always call it, the Prince Room. I actually spoke to the owner earlier, Paul, and he said to me, everybody calls up and books the room now and asks for the Prince Room. So just to help correct it, it is Studio 3 and it is informally called The Prince Room as well, but it's Studio 3. So we're here and we've actually been teaching a masterclass. We just finished day one of three days teaching here. And it's been rather wonderful because we have an all-star band. The bass player is Sean Hurley. is quite a famous and a very amazing bass player. But equally as well known is the rather wonderful Mr. Victor Indrizzo. For Fact Friday this week, I thought I'd answer some questions on drums. And the most common ones are this. I always get asked the whole idea of how I use overheads on a drum kit. If you'll notice the overheads, I actually have three going on the kit at the moment. But essentially, I usually use two, except when I'm in beautiful rooms like this, which have lots and lots of beautiful microphones. So let's just look at the overheads at the moment. Now, I'm just going to just show you what we've got going on here to the center of the snare. 45 inches and 45 inches. So, what does that mean? Both these overheads are exactly 45 inches away from the center of the snare. So, if you solo the overheads, the snare will be straight down the middle. Now, I have two different approaches of how I position. The reason why I'm doing it directly down like this is I want to get a good image of the symbols without too much room. Lots of times people do this and they'll have them pointing out like this, which works really, really nicely. But of course you can get rooms and an XY over the top. Other times I'll have a mic coming in wider on each side. So they tend to be a little bit lower to keep close to there. The problem with that is, is that they tend to favor one or more of the symbols. So if you're coming in low over here, this is gonna be the loudest symbol in the mix. This is gonna be pretty quiet. So the positioning here is getting a pretty even version of the symbols. Pretty even version of this symbol here with a little bit of the imagery of the kit. And it's really important to me because this is measured in phase, it's really important that I get an image of the drum kit. Sometimes it's 46 and a half inches. In this instance, it's 45 because I felt like this is as far enough away from the symbols as I want it. If you notice this distance here above this symbol, it's pretty equal to this distance above the symbols here. It's a little bit of line of sight, being logical about it, sitting here, putting the microphones so that it looks like they're getting an even amount of the symbols, but always making sure it's in phase with the snare. That's really the most important thing to me. The image of the kit is preserved with this effect. Now, I have a third microphone over there, which is a mono overhead, which again is exactly the same distance away from the center of the snare. Meaning I can use all three of these together, or if I want, I can just use the one. I can use this one mono overhead to get a view of the symbols. Now, a couple of other questions I get asked all the time. Do I ever use the versed mic or the sausage mic, as people like to call it? And yes, here is the Altec here. So this Altec microphone down here, sometimes known as the salt shaker, because it looks like a salt shaker, is pointing here towards, well, the sausage area of the drummer. <laughs> did I really just say that? I think I did. That's the joke and that's the reality. Look, the, it gives you a nice balanced view of the drum kit. 
But being an Altec, it's quite mid-rangey and very colored, but it gives me some sort of mid-range that I can dial back in. I get asked a lot about multiple mics on a kick drum. I've got the D112 inside, which is very typical inside a drum with a hole in it. But then I've got the, the kind of the oom, um, the energy, the air of the drum from the FET 47. Now, any large diaphragm really would do that. A FET 47 is a very typical microphone used all the time for it. But personally speaking, if you had another large diaphragm, it could probably do a great job. Then here, I've got a Coles pulled all the way back. It could be a little higher to let the sound develop. But the point is, is it's far enough back to get some of the lows, but it also gives me a nice kind of mono version of the drum kit. I tend to blend these two elements and then a little bit of this here, and that's my kick drum sound. And you can get the click and the attack from the mic inside, the air and an oomph from the outside mic, the FET, and then a little bit more from the coals. Those are kind of the standard things that I do, really. And once you put a 57 on the top and the bottom of the snare, I pretty much cover the drum sound. If I want, I could use just one of these kick drum mics, one mono overhead, and a snare top, and I've got a drum sound. Because really, you know, we've been talking about this a lot. It really does come down to the drummer. If the drummer is playing super evenly on a really nicely tuned drum kit, you're going to get a really, really great sound. There are tips and tricks that you can do to balance the drums. Like for instance, I get asked all the time, how do you get rid of harsh cymbals in a mix? Well, a couple of things you could do. You could put paper towels underneath, kitchen towels, and you could put it underneath and tape it. That will take off some of the real attack of some cymbals. Then in your room mics, you could distort the high end ever so slightly using like a lo-fi plugin, for instance. I talked about that with uh, Jakia King. And a little bit of distortion on that can help like darken the room mics as well. That's also another fantastic tip. But ultimately, all of those things are to fix problems. The best thing to do is not have the problems in the first place. And that is really, you know, communicating with your drummer, getting them to play consistently on the kick and the snare and the toms, but then using the hat and the cymbals in a more balanced way, especially the cymbals. They're not just crashing on the cymbals, then playing like small kick, kick, snare, dee, kick, kick, snare, dee, psh, you know, it does really come from the source. When you watch a drummer like Victor play, he will kind of go around the kit and when he hits the cymbal, he'll just hit it like this. It's a beautiful thing to watch. So I get asked a lot about my mono piano miking technique. Let me just pull this 47 out of the way a little bit so you can see here. So this is actually a C12A, which is an incredibly expensive, very nice microphone. But a 414 will do the same trick. The story of how I discovered this goes back to actually working at Sunset Sound with Dave Sardi on the Thrills record, Let's Bottle Bohemia. We had a C12A over the piano like this, and it was our only source of piano miking. We just put one mono mic on it. We then baffled off the piano so that the drums weren't bleeding into it because the band were tracking live in the room. Each day we would come in and we'd go, the piano sounds better. We'd be like, no, there's no way. It's like, it definitely sounds better than it did yesterday. And for basic tracking, it was about nine or 10 days to get all of the songs down on the record. And on the last day, we were like, it really does sound better. So we pulled off all of the packing blankets and the mic had fallen down and was like this. It was like inside one of the sound holes on the frame. So now what we do whenever we do a mono recording is we take a C12A or a 414, something that has a capsule that will fit inside of the sound hole on the frame and mic it. And it is an amazing mono piano source. Highly recommend it. It works definitely better when you've got a capsule that can, you know, mic this here. But if you don't have a flat capsule like that, just sort of, you know, try other kinds of microphones. But it's a really great way to get an excellent mono microphone sound. I really highly recommend it. Now, if you've got a small room or a room that doesn't allow you width for stereo miking, one of the things you can do is just take a microphone. Now this is obviously a really nice 67, but it could be any large diaphragm condenser. And 
mic a reflected surface. So what this is doing is actually miking the reflected surface off the wall. And it's a pretty great sounding mic. It really gives us this excellent kind of slappy, aggressive, hard surface sound. And those are the kind of things to get creative with drum sounds. Because of course you can take a blend of the drums and fit it into a reverb and create a perfect, you know, version of the drum kit, which is actually not a bad idea, and maybe a bit more off from the snare. But this gives you something twisted and unique. So look for areas in your own drum room and try and mic surfaces that will give you different sounds. We also have this Omni going at all times. This is our talkback mic, and it's heavily compressed so that everybody can hear each other talking to themselves. And one day, we accidentally put it into record and listen back, and it's this absolutely destroyed compressed room sound that sounds really nice, just blended in ever so lightly. So look for things like that. If you're using a talkback mic in the room so you can, everybody can hear each other, print it as well. It's not a bad idea. And it doesn't have to be the main drum sound, but a bit of energy from that, just like the Versed mic we were talking about over there that adds the mid-range. These kinds of microphones, they don't have to be loud, but just blended in will give extra energy to a drum track. Make it a little bit more interesting. Think about things like that. How can I just make it a little bit wrong? Because the thing about close miking, they can come up really nice and really nice, basically. Come up on the, on the console, in your session, sounding like nice and polite. These Microphones here are going to give you that same feeling of being in a room when the drummer's playing and it's just loud and it's kind of ear pissing, but it's exciting and energetic and you're watching the drummer play as opposed to sitting back in a control room listening to a nice polite set of close mics. These are the kind of mics that will give you energy and excitement to blend back in. So think about things like that. Think about versed mic. Think about a room mic in Omni like this. Think about a reflected surface. Think about these things that you can just blend back in to add excitement to your drum recordings. Hope you enjoy that. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. We'll see you all again very soon. So long, farewell, have you the same, au revoir.